Hello, everyone. This recorded presentation is a faculty workshop for colleague, colleague self-service, uh, as well as looking at how to set up the grade book effectively and accurately. Uh, these are probably more than likely going to be reminders and updates for most of you that are listening to this presentation. It is specifically for faculty, but um, everyone is definitely welcome. So let's just go ahead and jump in and get started. So the objectives for this workshop are, are as you see them. Uh, we will actually have two parts to this presentation. Uh, the first part deals with two tabs in particular, which are going to be the um, faculty and advising tabs. And we'll talk a little bit about what we see under these tabs and what is actually uh, important for us to make sure that we we do with these tabs as faculty uh, according to institutional instruction. Uh, normally in person, there's a little bit of a break in between, but for this recorded presentation, of course, we'll not have a break. We'll just keep it going. And you know, it's recorded, so you can pause and take a break whenever you like. The second part of the workshop deals with setting up the Canvas Gradebook. And this is specific for Stillman College faculty, um, according to, uh, you know, just some uh, questions and investigation from faculty and wanting to get a little bit more information about exactly what needs to be done and where can the information be found on Canvas. So we'll address things like the roll call attendance feature. That's definitely a big deal. We'll talk about uh, midterm one grading, which is really specific for housekeeping for financial aid for students, which takes place a few days after school starts. And so there are a number of things that we will discuss, but those are the big take homes. Looking at the self-service tab in colleague uh, and what are some things to be reminded of, and then taking a look at the grade book in Canvas um, as it relates to, uh, to students and you know, with some updates and reminders. All right, so here we go. The first thing that we'll take a look at is what the welcome screen looks like in Colleague. And, and I know you're probably saying, good Lord, I've been on this screen uh, so many times, but we just wanna make sure that if someone that is new, if it's a new hire or someone that really doesn't know a whole lot about Colleague, um, gets an idea of what it is that they will see once they click on these tabs. So of course, this is the welcome screen and you've got five tabs here. Most times if you, if you have additional access, you may have more, you may have less, but as far as faculty is concerned, these are the tabs that usually you see. The two tabs that we will take a look at today are going to be the faculty tab and the advising tab. So let's take a look first at the faculty tab. What happens when we click this tab? In the in-person uh, workshop, of course, we are going step by step and you have the opportunity to pull up your own individual information. In this recorded session, of course, there will be lots of things that are privacy oriented, so they may be blotted out or it may just simply be a blank screen with the tabs and we're just kind of talking through it. OK, so when we click on the faculty tab in, in self-service, this is what you see. You see a number of things, right? You see what the current uh, term is um, for um, uh, for that particular uh, academic um, entity, you'll see the courses that you're teaching for that term, what times, of course, and locations of those courses. It'll also tell you how many seats you have available um, in your course, um, at, or, or if you don't have any seats that are available. Most courses at this point do not have uh, textbooks per se that are associated with them and, and that may change in the very near future or not. But if you had a textbook that was associated with your course, this is where you would find it, okay? Or you would actually upload that information. And we will have probably a separate workshop on that if we get to the point where we actually are using books for, for all of the courses. This last column is not 
four faculty at the moment. That's for census dates and that's gonna be handled by financial aid. So the other uh, columns that you see are definitely of use to faculty. Everyone, of course, knows, <clears throat> you, oh, I hope you know, you know, what courses you're teaching, what times and what locations. For those faculty that have lots of courses that they're teaching during the semester, this is often very helpful. I have to be the first one to say that, you know, if I'm teaching four or five classes, sometimes at the beginning, I kind of get things mixed up or times. And so this is one of those places where you can find uh, that information. If you're teaching a rather large course and you wanna keep up with how many students are actually uh, in that class, how many seats you have available, sometimes this information is helpful because it helps you kind of figure out your pedagogy strategy. You know, Are you gonna be able to do individualized groups? Am I gonna have enough room to do that? Uh, how do I need to position these students to do certain activities and exercises? So knowing how many students are going to be in that course uh, is a very um, you know, good thing to know as well. Okay, so what happens if you click on one of those courses? What is it that you see uh, under uh, the class tab. Well, of course, you have your students listed there. You have their identification there, and you'll see that those entities are blocked out uh, during this presentation. One of the other things I like under this tab is that it shows you the classification of the student. And for courses where uh, it's not strictly, you know, a freshman course, or maybe it is a freshman course, and you look through your roster and you notice that you have seniors that are actually taking a freshman course. To me, that's helpful information because it sends off a red flag immediately, and I want to know, okay, hey, maybe I need to converse with this student uh, to see exactly why they're in this freshman course. Not saying that they shouldn't be there because some circumstances may warrant it, but it's good to know the class classification of the students that are in the course. Now, over on the left is where we will spend most of our time with this tab. Under the actual course, sorry about that, um, you get to, of course, see your roster, your students. There is an attendance tab, and we're gonna talk about how important that tab is, because according to institutional instruction, everyone is to take attendance on each day that the course actually meets. So this is a tab that you will use, you know, often, <laughs> consistently, uh, you will do this. And if you are an online instructor, of course, instead of being able to meet those students, you know, either on Tuesdays and Thursdays or Monday, Wednesday, Friday, uh, there, there is a, 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 not a qualification, but there is a requirement uh, when it comes to attendance. And that is associated with some type of assignment um, uh, or assessment each week that you can use as a form of attendance. It could be something as simple as maybe it's a survey that they take each week, or maybe it's a one question, you know, quiz or a bonus quiz or whatever, but there is a requirement of online courses, those instructors um, that are teaching, that there needs to be at least one weekly assessment uh, to account for attendance. And this is, you know, not negotiable, right? This is what we should all be doing as faculty. And once again, the census tab uh, is not of, uh, of concern for this presentation, that's for financial aid. We'll also look at the grading tab. This is where uh, the uh, midterm one grade for uh, financial aid and you know whether or not a student has attended the course at all will take place. We'll talk about that once we get to that tab. Uh, as of right now, as I mentioned, no books associated with most classes, but that could very well change in, in the very near future. And then the permissions tab as of right now uh, is not in use, but we'll talk about that that is a feature that is coming very, very soon. Uh, when we talk about permissions, we're talking about waivers, say maybe to get into a course, a student's trying to get into a course that's full, a professor needs to give the override or the permission 
hopefully pretty soon that will be an online process that you can take care of and colleague um, and, and a number of other things associated with requests, um, uh, you know, maybe even independent studies for students that are graduating, things of that nature, special permissions, uh, and that tab will hopefully be functional in the very near future. So let's go ahead and take a look at uh, some other features that uh, we can do uh, in this particular uh, space. So when we look at the roster of students, why this tab is important and how it can actually be a time saver is that you can actually email the entire course here under this tab. And uh, you can see here, you got a little button to the right that says email all or you can just simply click on the email of the student that you want to send an email to and do it in that fashion. And of course, you know, you can email separately from your individual emails, but this is really great because it shows that the email is actually coming from uh, the professor, it's coming from the actual course, and it is something that they need to identify with immediately. Now, for those that like a hard copy of their roster, um, you know, you wanna kill a couple of trees, <laughs> you can actually export your roster uh, so that you can either view it on the screen as an entire scrolling apparatus, or you can print the roster. For smaller classes, you know, this can be helpful if you're wanting to print that roster out to do some type of activity where you kind of need to uh, maybe correlate names and faces with individuals and where they're sitting and things of that nature. So there is some value, you know, to printing the roster out from time to time. But this is a place where you can easily do that. Okay, so here we are. This is probably one of the biggest things for faculty uh, under this course um, tab, and it has to do with attendance, okay? And once again, I just want to communicate that attendance taking is required for faculty that, you know, any course that, that we teach, we should be taking attendance on the days that we're actually holding the classes. And this is where we take this attendance. Uh, a lot of people probably still like to kind of take attendance by hand and that's fine, but this is an official place where that attendance needs to be taken. And so we see under this attendance tab, of course, we will see the student's name, we will uh, see a couple of other things here, uh, the actual date that you are actually pulling this up uh, where you can uh, put in whether they are uh, present or they're absent, right? Or they are absent and it's excused or they're absent and they're unexcused or maybe they're late. And in some courses, late uh, attendance can actually accumulate to be an unexcused absence. So these tabs give us the ability to uh, record those specific types of absences. Uh, and you can actually update a large amount of students at one time. You know, if everyone is there, instead of going through clicking, uh, you know, present, 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 you can actually update all. Or if for some strange reason, the entire class is absent, uh, you can do that um, as well this thing is, has a mind of its own. All right. And so one of the, the, the things that I want to kind of spotlight under this tab is the ability to actually put comments, uh, as, uh, you know, along with uh, the attendance reporting. And, and sometimes this can be very helpful for record keeping uh, and documentation. So if a student, you know, says, hey, I, I was sick right? And you say, well, where is your excuse? You know, did you go through uh, the VP uh, for uh, student affairs office to get an excuse? Do you have an excuse? So you can actually document uh, that there, you know, student absent, sick, no excuse, you know, student absent, provided excuse. So you have the opportunity to actually um, provide a status. And that takes place with this little blue button that is right beside 
um, selecting what type of attendance, whether they are present or absent, you know, or late. You can click on the little uh, little question cloud with the three dots, and it will actually give you the ability to type in some comments. Now, what's really nice about this is that the students cannot see the comments, okay? But uh, the registrar and other designated admin, they actually can see those comments. So it's helpful all the way around, especially if someone that, you know, like the registrar's office that is really um, tuned in to attendance, uh, as well as those that are in financial aid that may have this, this access, they can pull up a student to see um, if there are some comments about um, their attendance. You'll see here at the bottom that the attendance tab is coded to the academic calendar. So right now, uh, if you're in the workshop before classes actually start, or you're trying to access this information before your classes actually start, you won't see anything under this tab. But when courses do start, you will be able to see all of this information. All righty, so now we move over to grading. For most that are listening to this recording, you are very familiar with what's called midterm one grading. This is super important as you see highlighted there because uh, this carries a lot of weight. It also has a lot of consequences for students if it is not done accurately, okay? So midterm one, that column, midterm one, is for reporting whether or not a student has been present at least one time in your course before the designated institutional date that that information is due. And for fall 2022, uh, the date that has to absolutely you know, um, have an end, you know, for reporting is the 25th, I believe, of August. And I believe that faculty are supposed to start reporting this between um, August 20th and I think the 23rd. So there are institutional dates that are very definite for faculty to input this information into midterm one. Now, once again, for clarity, Midterm one is only for this reporting that goes to the financial aid office. If a student has been present in your course at least once or turned in and this, it has had some type of interaction with that course at least once, we are all unanimously to put H for here, okay? They've been present at least once. You know, it doesn't matter if they showed up one time and they haven't been back since, at least once. And H will go in this column for that student. If the student has not been present at all, I mean, like never set foot in the classroom, never done anything, you know, virtually related to the course, if that's appropriate, nothing, no interaction, then of course, you will put an NH in this column, okay? NH, those are the only two options for midterm one. NC is not an option at all. So if you've ever put that in that column before, never again, okay? Because at this point, it's just whether or not the student has shown up at least once, that would constitute an H. And if they haven't shown up at all, no contact with that course, then they receive the NH. So you may say, well, you know, Dr. Bray, why are we harping on this? Why are we taking so much time to go through this clarity? Well, the reason is, is that that little simple H or NH has a, has a really, really, really big effect uh, on the student if there is an NH there. 
it's going to affect their money. It's going to affect their financial aid. It's also going to cause them to be kicked out of that course. And so there are a lot of consequences to an NH being placed by a student's name. So we as faculty, we need to make sure that we are absolutely as much 100% sure as we can possibly be before we put this information uh, under this grading tab of either N or N. H. Okay, so those of you that teach online, uh, as I said before, it is uh, required that all online faculty include what's called an engagement assignment, uh, you know, um, within the first two days of class to do this particular verification. Right, so there needs to be something that students have to do within those first few days of class. Uh, as far as attendance taking, just normal attendance taking, of course, there needs to be some type of engagement assignment each week, something that gives some accountability, some tangible proof that that student has been on Canvas to address some type of assessment or assignment. Okay, but online faculty in, in, in respects to this midterm one grading, there needs to be some type of engagement assignment for, the, for your students within that first, you know, two days or so of class so that you can use that as your basis of putting in either the N or um, the NH, okay, whatever that deadline is for institutional input of this information. And uh, as far as I know, during this date of communication and this recorded presentation, uh, all faculty will have to verify attendance by August 22nd. Um, and if that date changes, that will be communicated uh, via the provost office. Okay, so what else can we do from this grading tab outside of the midterm one? Okay, the midterm one is super important. That's what's going to happen first. The other two uh, important um, moments, of course, will be for midterm grading, the actual midterm grade, and then, of course, the final grade. Now, I have to be honest, you know, as a faculty member, and I've been doing this for, for a good bit of time now. You know, a lot of times we don't put a lot of weight on midterm grades and, and I'll raise both my hands again. You know, for several years, I didn't really think that midterm grades were that important. But in reality, they they are because they do serve as what I call a reality check for students. It gives them the opportunity to turn things around if they so choose and get back on track and try to pass the course um, in a successful manner. And so midterm grades, of course, will go in the midterm uh, column. It says midterm uh, two here. Uh, from my understanding, this will hopefully just simply go to midterm. But if not, midterm two is where you would actually put the midterm grade. And that needs to be a letter grade. And the only options are A, B, C, or D. Okay. I'm sorry. Wow. This thing is just all over the place. A, B, C, D, or F, right? We hope that we don't have to put Fs in, but, you know, it happens. But uh, so no I's, you know, no other alphabets, just A, B, C, D, or F for the midterm grade. All right. And of course, for final grades, we would put in that column the final grade that the student receives, which would actually be a letter grade uh, according to um, the institutional grading scheme, of course. All right. And that is what we see here. So the one of the important things to discuss from this screen outside of the final grade, sometimes there are student situations that warrant what we call an incomplete. And not everyone, you know, goes along the same type of bases or requirements uh, for which they give an eye, you know, and I think that's a little bit of flexibility when it comes to um, different professors. But whatever the entity is that constitutes an incomplete, as faculty, there are lots of things that we have to make sure that we do on our end for completion 
of that eye so that it actually flourishes to an actual grade. And uh, for students, it's important for them to know what is involved in receiving an, in an I or an incomplete grade. We as faculty, of course, if we choose to give an incomplete to a student, you know, it puts a little bit of work on us because at that point, now we are being held accountable <clears throat> for making sure that the student knows what all is involved in changing that I to an actual grade for that course. And so once the I is given, a lot of times, you know, as faculty, we like to talk to the students before we actually give the I to say, hey, look, if, if I decide to do this, this is a detailed outline of what you have to actually complete these are the dates and deadlines by which you have to have it completed. And if it's not done by this date, then your grade of I will automatically change to the letter grade of F, right? So we just need to make sure that we communicate that with students so that they understand. Uh, there should also be some type of follow-up communication to take place. Uh, before the actual date of the deadline that the student should have the information completed. Normally, the time frame for a, a grade of I to be completed and changed to an actual grade is usually somewhere around maybe the mid portion of the next semester. Um, and, and a lot of that information uh, is usually communicated from uh, an institutional uh, standpoint, but making sure that the student knows that the I can't stay there forever. OK, these are the things that you need to complete. These are the deadlines by which they need to be completed. And if this is not done, then your grade will automatically uh, convert to an F. So um, these are all things that, you know, once we put these grades in under this tab, this is the one that really gives us as faculty, um, you know, a little bit of an additional step that we have to take to ensure, right, that we kind of cover ourselves uh, when it comes to giving these, these incompletes to students. Now, the other tab that we saw in the very end was the permissions tab. And like I said, right now it is not active, but it soon will be. Um, I got that communication. And so I'm really excited about uh, the possibility of having this tab because it gives faculty a lot more uh, freedom that is not, you know, running from one part of campus to the other, you can actually do it virtual, which is a beautiful thing, you know, which will include, but not limited to, you know, things like a uh, uh, request for entering a course without a prereq or taking a course along with another co-rec or uh, just giving uh, an override for your course, you know, um, instead of having to take the steps to go from one place to the other to do that, you just simply go in and uh, self-service and give that permission. So there will be more to come for the permissions tab. And, and I'm very excited um, about what is going to be associated with this tab. Now, the advising tab. Uh, this is one of the tabs that a lot of times uh, faculty, you know, as faculty, we don't spend a whole lot of time doing this except for specific times of the year. But when you click on this tab, of course, you're going to see the advisees that have been assigned to you. You can actually search on this screen by a student's name. Uh, you can see the IDs, all these things that are listed here. You can also see the last date of advisement, which is always very helpful uh, to see what the last date was. Uh, we're going to learn that there's also a place where you can put notes under this tab, and, and that way you can see who the last person was that advised the student and what they had to say and what was communicated. Um, the fourth bullet down is very important as well, uh, because under this tab, you can see whether or not there has been a request uh, from a student to have an evaluation 
of progress um, through their particular uh, programs. And so this is what that advising screen looks like after you actually put in a student's name and you click this little tab to the right that's called view details, okay? When you click on view details, this is what you see, okay? View details, which is at the right of the screen after you click on the student's name. And so you get to see, uh, of course, what their plan is, their timeline, uh, you know, what's their progress, but this little highlighted tab, which is notes, uh, is very, very important. You know, as a faculty member, we really like to make sure that we document. You know, we want to make sure that we cover ourselves when it comes to what has been communicated uh, to a student. And so this is a place where we can do that. You can actually make comments. And I think, you know, we should, when we sit down and advise a student, what's been communicated, if there's been any changes or if there are any comments that are pertinent um, as you know, with the student progressing forward with something, this is a really great place to put that information here, okay? All right, so in the real world, it would be time now for questions. And so what I would like for you to do, you're watching this recorded, pause it, pause the presentation, write down any questions that you have about any of the information that has been presented so far, send those questions to me or call me or come by my office, come by the center and see me and we can sit down one-on-one -on -one and go through uh, what needs to be done on the computer or we can talk about the questions that you have. Uh, you can call, email, any of that. But I just want you to pause the recording at this point making sure that you don't have any questions about what has been presented so far, okay? All right, so if you're paused and you're back, welcome back. So the second part of this presentation will deal with just a few things about Canvas gradebook setup and, uh, and why it's so important for us to talk about that during this presentation. Okay, so I'm one of those people, if you tell me to do something, I want to know why. I always want to know why. why. Why is it so important that I'm taking, you know, five, 10 minutes out of my day to listen to you talk about this? This is probably one of the most uh, important, you know, 30 seconds of, of a faculty's um, time right now, because when it comes to students' grades, you know, they can really, uh, you know, kind of get out of whack, they can get upset, we as faculty can get upset, but this is one of those really small things that we can do to kind of offset a lot of confusion when it comes to students' grades and we're using a platform like Canvas or Blackboard or something like that. So one of the first things that we need to do as faculty is to decide whether or not attendance is going to be part of our course. This is crucial, especially for the Canvas platform for Stillman, because there is a default setting for attendance in the gradebook that actually includes attendance in the total uh, calculation for the student's grade. It's actually included in their final grade calculation. And it's kind of unfortunate that it is defaulted as being included. So sometimes we may forget to go in and just click one little simple tab uh, or, or box to make sure that that does not happen. Uh, because, you know, when we don't, students look and they see, oh, you know, I have a C because the attendance is included, but they're actually failing the course or they have a D because that little box has not been checked or unchecked. So this is the first thing. Decide whether or not attendance is actually going to be part of your grading process. And if it is, decide how it's going to be involved. What's the percentage? You know, is it, is it a collective attendance? Is it certain times? All of that goes into whether or not um, you will include it and how you will include it. Okay, so we've already kind of talked a little bit about um, the importance of making sure that we do this. 
Uh, and that has to do with the fact that the student's grade will not be calculated properly. It will not be correct. So we as faculty will view that grade as one grade and the student will see it as a different grade. And the grade that the student sees, if this is not taken care of, is always higher than what we as faculty know that it is. So if we take the time to go through this little step that we're about to do, this will eliminate, you know, students showing up at your office saying, hey, you know, my grade's not correct or, or whatever the case may be. So let's take a look at what it is um, that we need to do. There is a tab in the grade book called role attendance. Okay, it's labeled roll call atten attendance. As, it, as I stated, this tab is gonna be automatically populated in your assignments on Canvas. Okay, just like if you were to put in a quiz or, or an exam, this column for roll call attendance is automatically populated and it is defaulted to actually be included in the student's final grade. So if you are a professor that actually includes attendance as part of the student's final grade, then you're in luck because all you have to do is just go in and set the parameters of the percentage that you want to, um, to assess to, um, to attendance, you know, and how you wanna break it down, you just have to adjust it. But if you're not using it, then we're gonna talk about what it is that you need to do. And I never knew that this one little step could be so detrimental. Uh, I, I trial by fire. I definitely learned that and, and, and had to kind of go back and correct some things. So that's one of the reasons why I wanted to share that with you during this presentation. Okay, so let me back up once more. Once you go to your assignments, even before you put an assignment in, you will see roll call attendance, right? And there's gonna, you see how there are 100 points associated with attendance? That's, that's the default, right? So you could see how that could quickly cause a problem when it comes to students' grades. So what you do is you just simply click on roll call attendance and then this is what you're going to see, okay? You're going to then click on this tab. OK, you'll click on the little settings tab here and you'll have two options. You'll have roll call settings and you'll have attendance reporting. So we're going to look at roll call settings. When we click on roll call settings, you're going to see a little box here that says do not count attendance toward final grade. If attendance is not going to be a part of your student's final grade, you will click this box, okay? You will click this box. If it is going to be part of your final grade, then you do not want to click this box, okay? There'll be a place for you to actually go in and put the percentage that you want attendance to, uh, to apply to, okay? There is also uh, a place for you to address lateness. Okay, if you're doing attendance um, and uh, being late counts a certain percentage off, you can adjust, adjust that percentage here. Uh, sorry, once again, it's just going crazy. Um, and you can adjust it right here. Okay, it's a little sliding scale and you can scale it, uh, slide it back and forth to adjust the percentage that you want to have uh, count towards lateness. All right, so the first slide included um, you not checking that box if you want to include attendance and then you just, you know, sift out your percentages. This slide alludes to not including attendance. And so, of course, we need to make sure that we check that box so that we can make sure um, that that does not happen. Okay, so the next tab that we'll see here is the course details tab that's in Canvas. Um, and, and you know, we wanna know 
uh, why this is so important. Why, what does this have to do with the actual grade book setup? Well, once again, I learned trial by fire how important this little step is as well. Now, I don't know if anyone has ever experienced this, but have you ever had a student when you've been teaching on Canvas to say, well, um, you know, the class average was X. And I saw that so many students made, you know, A's and so many. And I'm and the first question, how did how did you get this information? How did you know this? Well, <laughs> there is a place in your Canvas course where you can either give students access to this information or not. And I would strongly suggest that you not. <laughs> Unless it's something, of course, where you're, you know, maybe it's a teaching course and you want to teach students how to how to do this when they actually start teaching. But this section gives a lot or not of accessibility to students. OK, uh, whether they can look at course stats, whether or not they can have control and discussion groups, uh, whether or not they can actually look at specific totals uh, in the grade book. Um, you know, some totals you may not want students to see. So this is where you will make those adjustments. So it's under the course details tab. OK, so you just go into your course and once it comes up, you'll see those little tabs across the top that say course details, navigation, yada, yada. Course details is the first tab. When you click on it, this is what you see. Of course, you see when the course starts, when it ends. You can restrict a student, restrict your students from actually being able to view the course before the specific date that the course starts. Um, a lot of uh, professors like to have that date available before the course actually starts so that they can at least show the syllabus or at least show the, um, the reading material or the textbook for the course uh, before students actually come. So all of those uh, provisions are there. But what we want to look at is this whole business about student access to course stats, uh, discussion group interactions, and things of that nature. So what you would do is that you will click this button at the bottom that says more options, more options. When you click on that, you're going to be able to see some descriptions at the bottom and you'll see lots of boxes like you see here that are either checked or unchecked, okay? Here you can um, specify options about announcements. You can show, show your current announcements on the course homepage or not. And if you do, you can, you know, choose how many announcements you want to actually be visible. Uh, for someone like me that gives a ton of announcements, I may only want three, the top three, the most recent announcements to be visible, but you can choose that. You can do that right here. The other boxes you see here, you know, can give student access to actually attach files uh, to discussion threads um, or create their own discussion topics. Uh, most of the courses that, that, you know, that I, I teach, I don't allow certain things to take place. Um, sometimes letting students organize their own groups can, can be a problem, <laughs> you know, but if that's something you want your students to do, this is where you would actually give that permission. But the last two are probably, uh, two to me, are, are the most important. There is a box that you can check or leave unchecked that says high grade distribution graphs from students. This is where students can actually see the stats for your course. Everything that is taking place that is an assessment or that students are interacting with, they can see it. Everybody in the class will be able to see that, see that if you do not check this box, okay? Uh, so you wanna hide that for most classes. The last one says disable comments on announcements. Me personally, 
I don't want students commenting on my announcements. I want those to be available for the entire course, for, for the entire class. So if you've got you know, questions about an announcement, then you'll need to email me, right? Or come and see me personally if you don't understand or you need additional clarity. But uh, I don't, you know, most, most, most professors don't want students to be able to uh, comment on announcements. So this, these are just some little tidbit things um, that kind of makes our life as faculty members easier if we know where it is and what to do kind of, you know, slows down confusion on, on both ends um, later on, you know, uh, in the semester. Okay, so the next thing that we just want to mention briefly is, you know, when we want to know how many students we actually have in our course and who those students are, there are a few places where you can look at the enrollment in your course, the attendance tab, which we've already taken a look at. The other is a tab that is uh, on the left side, left hand side in Canvas in every course. When you click on the course, if you scroll down, if it's enabled, you will see a tab that says people. We, as the instructor, when we click on that tab, it shows us, you know, all the students that are in our course. If they have pictures that are associated with their names, we can see their pictures, we can see their email addresses, their, um, their school IDs, you know, all of that information. But when a student clicks on that tab, they too can see everyone that is in that class. They have access to their email address. They have access not to their student IDs, but definitely their name and their email address. And, um, and so it's with this tab, a lot of times that students will form their own personal uh, group me chats uh, where they can, you know, sometimes use them for good and then sometimes use them for evil. So, uh, but you know, there's also a privacy issue here because, you know, some students may not want another student to know what their email address is. And unfortunately, if Canvas has not uh, taken care of this for a particular institution, as far as this tab is concerned, students have access to knowing who the other students are in the class. And this may not be so important, you would think, in, a, in an in-class, in-person course, but it is. And it's even more important with an online course, because with an online course, you know, uh, most people take those courses for convenience because they have a lot of other things going on. They're really trying to be disciplined and focused. So if you've got, you know, at even 10 people in a course that has, you know, 100 people, that are trying to form groups and they're emailing people and, you know, people have to take their time out of their day, that can really cause a problem. So this is a decision that, you know, we as um, instructors have to decide, you know, are we going to allow students to see who the other students are in the course? And it's that people tab where you would go in and disable that. So in Canvas on that, that main page at the bottom in settings, you would simply click on settings and find where people, uh, the people tab is up top and just simply click and drag it down to the bottom and enable it. And we can talk about that more uh, in a different um, uh, uh, workshop, but definitely important to remember. And then the last tab where you can actually see, of course, who your students are in your, in your class is the grades tab. So to give you, a, once again, an idea of where this people's tab is on Canvas, of course, when you click on your course, you'll go all the way down until you find people. And you'll see in this example that the people's tab has actually been uh, disabled uh, on this. Here we go again on this view. Um, you'll see there a little eye with a line through it means that students are not going to be able to see that. Right. I can as the instructor but they will not be able to see uh, who else is in the class. Okay, <clears throat> something else that's very important when it comes to gradebook is making sure about assignments, 
right? If you are getting your course together before the, uh, the semester starts, or maybe it's a couple weeks after you've started, you've started loading assignments <clears throat> and assessments, you just want to confirm, you know, that the number of assessments that you have set out to be on Canvas are actually there, right? Making sure that the deadlines uh, for those assessments and assignments are correct and that they're actually showing up on Canvas. You know, I can't tell you how many times that, you know, I have gone through the process of putting things up there and then students will say, Dr. Gray, I can't, I can't, I can't find it. I don't see it. It's not showing up. And uh, it may sometimes be fault of my own, but most times it's usually some type of glitch or something that is going on with Canvas. So just confirming that those things that you have created and uploaded are actually there and they actually, you know, are uh, uh, the same as what you have already, you know, what you prepared and what you actually intend uh, to be there, okay? And this just helps to hold students accountable, you know, and, it, and we as faculty, that's what we want, right? We want our students to become accountable for their own learning as much as they possibly can. So making sure that those assessments and assignments are loaded on Canvas with dates, also in the calendar for, for Canvas, uh, reminders and things of that nature. Uh, that way it just kind of puts a little bit of pressure off of, off of us as faculty and just kind of gives that accountability to the student because it's there, it's set up, it's confirmed, it's correct, so you just need to make sure that you get it done on your end. So this is probably one of those things about Canvas that I love. Anything that I can use as a faculty member to help students become more accountable for their own learning and their own actions, I am all for that. So preloading things onto Canvas, uh, we'll have another workshop later on about how powerful delayed announcements are and how powerful the calendar is in Canvas as far as making sure that these assessments and assignments and things like that are actually part of the dynamic um, uh, calendar that is on Canvas. Okay, so this deal about making sure that you know, the gradebook is as accurate as it can possibly be, uh, this has to do with that total grade column that is in Canvas. A lot of uh, professors, you know, just in lieu of keeping all the confusion down, they will say, hey, I'm not going to have a total grade column. But that is a two-edged sword because students then have no idea what their actual grade is at any particular time. So just from understanding instructional, I mean, institutional instruction is that, you know, we as faculty need to have a total grade column and it needs to be as accurate as possible so that students, you know, don't have, as I like to say, an excuse for saying, well, I don't know my standing uh, in this course. So doing things like making sure that that attendance tab is, I mean, the attendance roll call reporting is correct whether attendance is going to be included. Uh, also want to make sure that, you know, the assignments are posted, they are up with the correct amount of points um, and things of that nature. Dur with this column, you can also weight grades. You know, you could have, say, maybe quizzes are going to be worth 30% of the course, you know, exams are going to be worth, you know, 40% of the course. So this is where you can actually weight particular assessments and assignments um, uh, that will all dump in to this total grade column. So it's really important to make sure that we set this grade book up as accurate as we possibly can. So looking at the total grade column in gradebook, okay, it's actually a running total of all the graded assignments, okay, which, and, and for the faculty, we can actually see grades that are hidden, because sometimes we want to hide grades, we don't want the students to see them immediately, or maybe it's something that we said, hey, 
take this assessment and uh, it won't be included or you won't be able to see it until a specific time. So, but the total grade column is going to include all those assignments, uh, even those with the hidden grades, okay? Um, you can actually have students to view the totals either as a point value. Um, there are some ways that you can actually change it where it's a percentage, uh, you know, with a, a particular letter grade according to the schematics of grading. Uh, either way, you can sort the columns. Oh my goodness, so many different ways. Um, you know, maybe you want the grades to be sorted from low to high. Maybe you want them from high to low. Um, there are several options when it comes to sorting this grade book and this particular column. If you want to switch between or toggle between these different types of displays, you can see here to the left under uh, the grade book at the very end in that total grade column, you've got three vertical dots. When you click on those dots, this is where you're going to get some of this, uh, some of these options where you can actually sort by a number of different ways. You can display the grade that's in that total grade column as points. You can do it as percentage. You can do it as a letter grade. There are several different things um, that you can do. And you can just switch back and forth you can have the grade column at the very end, right, of the grade book, or you can have the grade top column at the very beginning of the grade book. So there's a lot of flexibility as to where this total grade column goes and how you want it to be presented to the students. Now, for courses that have a lot of assignments or you're really into having group uh, assignments or group activity uh, within your course, this is, you know, where you will probably find a lot of, uh, of goodies for you uh, when you're talking about creating assignment groups as far as quizzes, sometimes it is actual groups, you know, that are going to give a certain percentage. Um, there's a lot of variability here as well, but the big deal here is where you uh, actually give percentage to a lot of those assessments and assignments that you will uh, give to your class. You can weight those assignments, and you'll see an example here where uh, say maybe you have essays, they're going to be worth 50%, you have quizzes, 40%, discussions, 10%, and of course, it'll all add up to 100%. Um, they're going to be weighted. So you'll have assignment groups that are actually listed in the grade book. And so say, for instance, mm, say you start out, you want to do five assignments but your uh, oh, five discussions and discussions are worth 10%. Well, if you add five more, the graded discussions are still only gonna count for 10% of that grade if they are weighted. Of course, the number will dictate, you know, what the percentage will be for the student, but the maximum will be 10% of that grade. So I really like this feature as well because it gives us as faculty a little bit of flexibility also, you know, if I give eight quizzes and, I, you know, that's what I intend, maybe I may fall short one or maybe I may have, you know, an additional one, but that percentage is still going to be what I weigh it or set it as. So this is a really good uh, part of the grade book to learn how to do uh, if, you know, uh, if you're not used to doing it, if very well may be something that you want to do in the future, just to kind of make things simple uh, on your end as well as for the students. Okay, I'm sure everyone listening to this presentation at this point knows how to create an assignment uh, in, um, in the, in, on Canvas uh, to be a part of the gradebook. Uh, this demonstration shows you how to create those assignment groups that we were just um, discussing. You know, whether you want the assignment group to be quizzes or a discussion, you know, uh, whatever it is that you decide to do. And it shows you how to put the percentages in. It's very easy. You just simply click on assignment groups and then you are going to, uh, uh, 
give a name to that group, you'll also give a percentage to that group. And when you create the assignment, you actually create it inside of this group. So everything stays together. At any time, you can actually delete an assignment group um, that actually has an assignment in it. And Canvas will ask you, do you just simply want to delete the name of the group or do you want to delete the name of the group and the assignments that are included? So you have options there uh, once you start doing these little drop downs for assignment group. OK, this is also a very important part of Gradebook. And once again, I had to learn by trial and error years ago when I first started using Canvas, how your grades will be posted on Canvas. You know, do you want your grades posted immediately as you're entering them? Do you want to wait, right? And so you've had a chance to kind of accurately calculate, make sure that everybody's grade is correct before the students are actually able to see it. So the default is to make all grades visible to students. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, Canvas, you're just really trying to give us some headaches here. All these defaults are things that are so open and so much access to those that are participants in the course. So the default is for students to be able to see any grade that goes into Canvas immediately as soon as it's entered or as soon as they take an assessment, uh, it comes right up. You can control that. You can control when students actually see or, or when their grades are actually posted. So for me, I highly recommend, you know, hiding the grades until all grades have been, uh, you know, checked for error, you know, maybe you need to, you know, uh, add a couple of points, maybe, you know, whatever the case may be, wait until it's all said and done before giving students access to those grades. Now, not everybody wants to do that, and that's fine, okay? It's your choice, however you want to do it. There is a portion that's called uh, posting, you can either have manual posting or you can have automatic posting. Uh, myself, like I said, to give less accessibility to those grades until they are checked, I do a manual posting, which only I or whoever has you know, um, access in that course as the instructor will actually release those grades to the students. So when we do manual posting, you simply go to the course in Canvas, you find the assignment column that grades are going to go into, whether it is a, a virtual assignment where the grades, you know, they'll, they'll be ready immediately, or it's where you're going to have to manually uh, put in grades. You simply scroll to the right of that assignment heading and you'll see those three vertical dots. When you click on them, you're going to get a drop down menu. That's where you're going to click on grade posting policy. When you see that, there's going to be a screen that comes up that says post grades. You have two choices. You can choose to have those grades posted automatically. That means as soon as the student finishes, it comes, it goes right in or as soon as you start entering a batch of grades, everyone that's entered, the student's gonna be able to see it immediately, or you can choose to do it manually, all right? Which means that you will hide those grades until you're, you're ready for the students to actually be able to view um, those grades. But it is a default of automatic access for students to see those grades. So how do you do that? Okay, um, once again, if the grades are hidden where students can't see them, you'll see the little eye with a slash through it. Okay, so here's an example right here. And those three dots right there on the side, right? When you click on those dots, it's gonna give you options for posting uh, the grades. And uh, you click on grade posting policy, 
And of course, those two options automatically, that means the students will be able to see them as soon as those grades are entered, or you can do manual. Now, the trick to this is this, okay? If you are going to do this, you need to decide before the students take the assessment whether or not you want students to see these grades immediately. Because if, say, for instance, you have uh, a virtual exam, students are taking the exam online, and you decide that, oh gosh, I don't want, you know, I don't want them to be able to see their grades. Well, if someone has already taken the assessment and you do manual posting, the grades are definitely going to be default of hidden, but only those that haven't already been posted. Okay, so those students would all, they would be able to see their grades, but everybody else would not. And that can cause a problem as well. So you want to make sure that if you do this, that it's done before the students actually take the assessment. And as easy as it is to choose this option, it's even easier, right, to post the grades because you just simply go on, click those same buttons again and click the tab that says post grades. It's gonna ask you if you're sure and you say yes, and then it's going to take a few seconds and it will post those grades and it will also send out an email to students saying, hey, the grades for this assessment, yada, yada, has now been posted. Okay, so this is a really nice feature um, also just to kind of, you know, keep things on an even keel so you don't have any mistakes that are running around out there. All right, so this is just a continuation of that. Uh, showing how you can post the grades. Once you click everyone, like I said, everybody will be able to see their grades uh, and there will be an, uh, uh, an announcement or an alert that goes out to students to let them know that their grades have been posted. Okay, so normally in an in an in-person workshop, I would be asking for as many questions as I could possibly get, uh, you know, to make sure that everyone has as much clarity um, as they need. Uh, so once again, you're watching a recording, so I want you to pause right now, write down any questions that you have about any portion of what we talked about for just a quick view of gradebook setup. Make sure that you email me those or come by and see me, right, um, or give me a phone, phone call so that we can discuss it, whatever is best for you because I want everyone to have as much clarity as they need, right, going forward um, in this semester. So a few things that I wanna discuss are in this presentation as well as in person, we've got a lot of proposed workshops that will be coming up this fall um, and, and also kind of spilling over as a continuation in the spring. And this slide just shows you a few of those things. Uh, there will be an introduction to metacognition, uh, which is, you know, all about thinking about how you think. And so we'll, we'll talk about that. Also have a session where you have the opportunity to listen to uh, some strategies that are associated with metacognition and kind of see which ones that you may like. Uh, there will also be a workshop on a pedagogical strategy that I actually developed several years ago that has been proven to be very helpful to students as well as to faculty. Uh, really helps with the accountability for students called Grandma's Recipe. So we'll talk a little bit about that, uh, the implementation, of metacognition into your syllabi, into courses. So there's a lot of things that we have scheduled uh, for the future. But what I would like to know from you as faculty, what do you need? What workshops do you want? That's, that's, what, that's what the Center for Teaching and Learning is all about. It is all about you as faculty, providing you what you need uh, to make your jobs more efficient, make your jobs, you know, better for you as faculty. You know, anything that can lighten our load a little bit, I'm all for that. And to be a part of this Center for Teaching and Learning is a wonderful opportunity because that is what the center is for. It is for you. It is for faculty. So 
watching this as a recording, if you haven't already, please, please, please email me, you know, workshops or things that you are interested in as a faculty member that you would like to know more about. Or maybe it's something that you, uh, you know, have a special niche for that you think other faculty member members could benefit from. And we can schedule a time to uh, for you to present and, and to give a workshop to your peers. So all of these things uh, we are super interested in. So please, please, please uh, reach out to me and let me know. Uh, what your needs are and, and what it is that you have interest in that the Center for Teaching and Learning can actually uh, do for you, okay? So at this point, I just thank you for your time and your attention. And as always, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Uh, my email is rgray, that's with an A, rgray at stillman.edu. And you can contact me anytime. Uh, temporarily, I'm located in Geneva Hall in the back office right by the computer lab, which is where we will be having uh, uh, most, if not all, of our faculty workshops. Thank you so much. And each of you have an amazing rest of your day or evening, if that's the case. <laughs>